and we welcome everybody here. For those of you new to Zoom, uh, you are not actually muted by our Zoom master, Zach Jory, and thank you, Zach, for hosting this meeting. But he promises me that if anybody gets rowdy, he can not only mute you, but he can <laughs> eject you. So no, no rowdiness. <laughs> Uh, if you have a question at any time, uh, you can send a message in the chat room and Zach will be monitoring those for answers or if you can uh, refer the question to somebody who can answer it, hopefully. So that would be the best way to communicate at this point. Uh, as I have said earlier, we have a few announcements and then we'll turn it over to Colin and then to our speakers. And feel free to use that chat uh, liberally. It's a, it's a good way to communicate questions or comments even. So I have a couple of the announcements I have. Number one, we have a real important event here in less than two weeks and that's our national vote. I'm not going to say who to vote for or what to vote for. I'm just going to say, please, please, please get out and vote. Your vote counts, it matters and it's important. So vote whenever you can. You may have received uh, some emails in the past week or so from our uh, fundraising campaign. Uh, I know the members and uh, the non-member volunteers that we've had have received these letters. Because of the virus, uh, our financial situation needs improvement. And so we've chosen this mechanism to uh, increase our donations, our, uh, our bank account, so to speak, and we really hope you will consider a generous donation. We've also sent similar emails to our uh, corporate donors who have been very generous in the past. I know a lot of our corporations are struggling too, and we hope that they will be able to contribute as well to help the financial picture of the chapter. Next month, our business, uh, we will hold our uh, annual business meeting. This is a departure from the time of our normal annual business meeting because we changed the bylaws last spring. In the past, this has always been held in May at our last chapter meeting of the meeting season. Now with the change in the bylaws, we decided to hold this annual business meeting in November so you will hear from me for the state of the chapter over the past really 18, 19 months. You'll hear from Ryan Hogan, who is our treasurer. He'll give a brief financial report. We will have an election of our, uh, on the slate of candidates that's been proposed by our leadership development and nominations committee. And then also we will have a speaker. So uh, we hope you all can attend that and look forward to seeing you then. Again, please come and vote. Your vote matters and it gives support to the people that have agreed to uh, run the chapter from a leadership standpoint. And we hope uh, you will give them your full support as they take their office on January 1st. So at uh, this time, I'm going to introduce uh, Jeannie Weaver who has an important announcement for us. Hi everybody, thanks for um, donating to our raffle. Basically, that's what it turns out to be a donation, but um, it's very important to us and it helps our fish. So I uh, just wanna announce the winners. Our first winner for prize one, which is the uh, Jack's Rod, is Frederick Salmond. Huh? And then our second prize is Ron Belkin's book and a pair of forceps. Uh, Colin Glover. Oh. And um, prize three was won um, by Isaac Valdez. And I actually won prize four because I have to start the raffle by doing a ticket. So <laughs> somehow it picked me. Um, and then our last prize, prize five, is Frederick Ebert. So. Oh. Congratulations to everybody and thank you for joining us and we'll have new prizes next month. So be sure and check out the raffle. Thanks so much. Now, Jeannie, at our face-to-face -face meetings, a lot of people rush in there to buy the very last tickets uh -huh. because they think that gives them a better chance of getting picked. So yeah. you've just proven 
that there's no need to wait. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Jeannie. Jeannie's done a lot of work on getting these uh, raffles up and running. Um, and we really appreciate her efforts on this. She's had to work through the Secretary of State as well as with TU National, who helps us sponsor the uh, process that we go through. And Jeannie, thank you very much. I just can't say how much I appreciate your efforts in this. Oh. <laughs> so. Well, thank you, it's my pleasure. All right. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Colin, who organizes our meetings for us and especially rounds up our speakers. We've had some really, really good speakers on these virtual meetings, and I'm sure that tonight is uh, gonna be no different. So Colin, it's all yours. You need to unmute, Colin. <laughs> there we go, how's that? Um, so tonight we've got uh, Taylor and Travis, the guys from Flycast. Um, as you may have seen in our most recent, uh, well, I guess, two or three months now uh, for our newsletter. Um, they've been contributing, um, you'll see it down at the bottom. Um, Flycast um, uses the, blends their on water experience um, and then creates a dynamic uh, forecasting model with up to date uh, river conditions and uh, fly fishing uh, forecasting. So you can explain it better than I can guys. So I'm gonna turn it right over to you and I look forward to hearing all about it. Awesome, thank you, Colin. Um, I'll go ahead. We have a presentation for you guys. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Not sure if I need approval for that. Let me give it a shot. Uh, desktop, one. desktop one. All right. Here we go. All right. Sorry, guys. Just one second. Um, it looks like I may need to jump out of the meeting really quick in order to pull this up. I apologize. We'll jump right back in. Sorry about that. We'll be right in. Anybody have a good fishing story? I got skunked this weekend for like the first time in three years. So <laughs> bad fishing story. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I caught a 19 incher up at uh, Fremont Canyon on a size 20 Adams. Oh, nice. Five X tippet. Very nice. What was it? A bow or brown or to get one of those cuts in there? That was a rainbow. Rainbow. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, there was a, a spinner fall oh. and this big guy was just hanging out. He looked like a whale, there just, are you know, filter feeding. There. Yep. Um, nice. Shallow water. What's that? Shallow water. Yeah. Up against the bank. On the far edge. Yeah. Yep. Took a while to get a good drift in front of him, but he snapped it out. Anyone doing much Euro nymphing? Uh, there's a number of us that have started. Um, actually, the next day we were up at the mile and I pulled seven out of a hole with my Euro rod. And this hole had probably five different currents in it. So that's the beauty of it. If a strike indicator would just float over the top and swirl and the, you wouldn't get a good drift, but by going deep and with no drag, it, it worked out really well. A uh, two fly rig or a single? I had two fly rig. Two fly rig. Yeah, I caught them all on a uh, a tiny with size twenty beta submerger. Yeah, I've been trying to do when I do it a single. Yeah. Rather than a double. Yeah. Just easier for me. Yeah, you avoid some knots and breakage. Right. And kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, looks like our flycast group is back, so I will turn it back over to them. Thank you, guys. This is 2020's world of uh, technical difficulties. So um, thank you guys for having us. Uh, my name is Travis. This is Taylor. Uh, we founded Flycast uh, about three and a half years ago. 
Um, and as Colin kind of touched on, really our main focus is to provide up-to-date river reports and fishing reports for the rivers in Colorado. Right now we currently cover 14 or 15. Um, and really, so our passion is just on helping anglers have a more productive time on the water. And there's a ton of factors out there and Taylor and I have really just dedicated the time to do that research to provide you with the information you need to catch more fish and have more fun on the river. And so really what we're gonna to do today is um, dive into you know, our background a little bit, why we believe reporting is so important. I'm sure there's plenty of people on here that leverage reports at one time or another, and then give you, you know, our methods to the madness or how the sausage is made, really what goes into our research in order to provide these accurate and up-to-date and forward-looking reports for you all. Cool. So first, you know, a little bit about who we are. Um, this is my professional mug shot. The, uh, the Flycast gig is, is a side hustle at the moment. Ultimately, we want it to be our, our full-time deal, but, you know, right now we're, we're keeping the, uh, the lights on. But my background is in uh, economics and finance. Uh, my current role is to forecast oil and natural gas production across the U.S., and Travis is a project manager for IBM dealing with finance and big data. So really the, the idea was to bring together sort of these professional skill sets that we've learned in terms of forecasting and data analysis to the fly fishing world. And so this is really who we are. This, and we're anglers at heart. We love to be out on the water. We like to catch big fish. And um, uh, ultimately, our goal with Flycast is to share as much knowledge as we can with uh, people like you. And so we really appreciate you guys having us out and um, excited to tell you a little bit more about what we do. So, you know, one of the quotes that we come back to uh, from time to time when we think about fly fishing is, you know, there's this fine line between standing on the shore or between fly fishing and standing on the shore like uh, an idiot. And so the goal here is to, you know, help us bridge the gap between standing on the shore, not catching any fish, doing the same thing over and over and actually catching, you know, big, beautiful trout. You know, the, the experience of fly fishing brings us a lot of solitude. It's an escape from the wives in, in some cases or husbands in uh um and others but you know at the end of the day you know it's it's just a it's a pleasure to be out on the water and to you know experience nature in sort of this cathartic way that you know most folks don't necessarily get the opportunity to do and so what is the problem um as taylor mentioned we're avid anglers we've been fishing for a long time and you know like some of you we were leveraging reports we were uh reaching out and using the local fly shops website to look at the reports, figure out, okay, we're heading out to Deckers, what's gonna be working? Um, well, what we started to realize when we got smart enough is, you know, fly shops don't necessarily have the time nor the, are they invested from a financial standpoint to really keep these up to date. And so we realized that while there's some great information in these reports, if they're a month old, two weeks old, heck even three months old, while there's good information in there, they're useless. Things have changed, you know, those patterns that were working a month ago might not be what's going on now. And so the focus was to really solve for that problem and provide the most up-to-date reports in the state. And so what we have here is a fantastic report from a shop here in Colorado, um, provides really good information. Um, but what we realized were a few things that we can point out in this report. And one is the date. I pulled this report yesterday as we all know, it's mid-October, so this report is now two weeks old, um, two months old. It's talking about Deckers, which is a heavily fished river, and so that's that's the first indication that you know this report not might not be as accurate as possible. A good example of that is if you guys all know, two months ago, Deckers was roaring, 600 cfs. Fishing tactics were incredibly different. Right now, flows are down at 50 cfs, so it's a difference of 600 cfs which impacts a lot of different things, such as the clarity of the water, the bugs in the water, and where trout might be holding. And so it was this exact issue that drove Taylor and I to 
take it upon ourselves to resolve it and provide anglers in Colorado with more up-to-date information so that they can actually apply that on the river and be more successful. So I'll just click through some of these just to get it out of the way. Um, so yeah, Travis taught, touched on, you know, what, what the difference between, you know, what a stale report might look like and what you'd actually like to see, but let's just go through the, the checklist really quick. You know, we got the, the timeliness of the report, you know, August 19, like that's no longer useful. The, the flows, you know, a lot of these reporting websites, they actually do have live flows, but the, the report itself, you know, is based on a flow level that was actually dated. Um, also, you've got the flies, which, you know, traditional reports do a pretty good job of, but, you know, if you're in this transition period where we've gone from <clears throat> sort of early fall to late fall, you know, the flies actually do make a big difference. So if you're looking at August 19 versus, you know, October 21st, like it can make a big difference. And so that's kind of where um, the timeliness comes into matter. But you also got to look at the, the amount of information that is provided. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you'll get reports with, you know, one or two sentences based on, you know, what a guide had seen in the last couple of days and what was working at that time. But with our reports, you know, we take a little bit deeper dive. We analyze all the different fundamentals. And in a lot of cases, you know, we give you, you know, sort of an if-then situation. It's like, you know, this week, you know, we're expecting temperatures to drop. Here's what you should do. And then beyond that, we have our daily forecast. So I don't know of anybody that's doing this, um, but we have a seven day forecast where you can specifically click on a day that you're expecting to fish. Let's say, you know, you, you're expecting to go out and hit Deckers on Saturday. You can go see what the report is for that day based on the various um, variables that, that impact fishing. All right. So I'm just going to give you guys an example instead of pulling up a website. If, if you guys haven't visited our website, it's flycastusa.com, but I'm going to show you the, the ingredients that go into each individual river report, just to give you an idea of the detail that we look at and the detail that we think is necessary to have a good day on the river and really understand what's going on. Um, so first and foremost, you know, we have a report here. We have a weekly overview. We're not biased about these rivers. I don't care if you fish, you know, Pooter's a bad example for right now, but, you know, we don't have a vested interest if you fish uh, the blue or you don't fish the blue. We're not trying to push guides onto that. And so we're going to tell you how we think it's fishing. And then we're going to give you a detailed uh, report right here. And then also talk about ideal days to fish. Based on that, we're really just looking at conditions such as flows, weather and whatnot, just really figure out what are the ideal days um, to get out on the water. Obviously, most of us plan, it, plan that day a week in advance whenever we can get out of the house, but um, it's, it's nice to see really which days we expect to be the most productive. And then along with that, you know, the, the suggested flies for this time of year for that river, we always talk about it in the report, but down below, we really try to expand on everything that, you know, should be in your box at that time. Of course, we have flows, you know, we, we have a, two awesome data guys on our side that have been able to scrape flow data and create a chart for us that displays discharge and gauge height, similar to how DWS and USGS does it. But um, through that, you're able to understand a lot of uh, behavioral traits from trout, which we'll end up going over. Weather, weather is critical, you know, whether it's not wanting to fish in 30 degree weather or, you know, wanting to find that overcast day, um, weather gives you good insight. And then this is what Taylor was talking about from a forecast standpoint. So you go in, you can read the report. That's a holistic review of what the river is doing right now. Um, but say you're getting out on Saturday, we dissect exactly what's happening on that day. So for example, you know, it's going to be a nice day on the river with stable temperatures, um, partly cloudy skies, so trout are adjusting depth, and then talking about the pressure and as far as what the pattern should be that you come to the river with and plan to, to start out fishing. So I, I really like the word that you use there, the, the unbiased side of things. And I think that's, I think that plays a big role in, you know, our goal and our mission for, for Flycast. You know, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, what the, 
uh, some of the, the downside to some of the other reports, but you know, that isn't always their, their main priority. And we know firsthand, like it takes a lot of work and a lot of resources to actually keep up with this stuff. So um, we understand um, that it, it isn't easy, but the fact that it's unbiased is, is incredibly important to us. So at the end of the day though, you know, our goal is to help you increase your fly fishing knowledge, <clears throat> number one, uh, regardless of, of where you're at on the water um, and your skill set. We want to help you eliminate the guesswork and then you know un or avoid those unproductive rivers. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we write a number of blogs. We we even piece it in there into some of our reports. But the ethics and, and safety side of things, you know, fall is a perfect example of of this. You know, we've got the the brown spawning right now, and there's a lot of chatter about you know people targeting spawning trout. In some cases, people don't know that they're targeting spawning trout. So our goal is to help, you know, provide transparency to that, help people understand, you know, what the ethics are and help people hold themselves and others accountable. So we can, you know, have future generations of a great fishery. So, and I'll just say on the safety piece, it really comes into play in the spring when, you know, when the pooter's ripping, um, it's probably, sometimes it's not safe to be on the river. It's not safe to wade. So not getting out in the water. There's, you know, waders are a death trap, especially if water gets in them. So that definitely plays into it as well. All right, so we're gonna start getting into the, the meat of this and talk about our approach. And so Taylor and I aren't out on the river every single day. We wish we were, um, but we're not, we're out a ton. Um, so what we needed to do and what we realized is Trout are ultimately predictable creatures. Just like humans, there are a number of factors that drive certain behaviors and feeding patterns and tendencies. Um, so through that, we were able to develop a baseline model that assisted us in times where we don't have boots in the river um, to where we can get a pretty good insight into how the river's fishing and what the conditions look like. And so the way we do that is we really leverage three main information sources. One is public data. Like we mentioned before, you know, flows, weather, that's all readily available. Um, we leverage that and we pull it all together, scrape it together, and we're able to, to piece together our variables and get a good sense of what we expect from trout. Um, aside from that is our on-river experience. You know, we're out there at least once a week. Um, and then in the times we're not, we have a, an ambassador team, a group of five anglers who are either avid anglers like ourselves or professional guides. And they'll come off the water and they'll shoot us an email or a text and say, hey, it was out on the big T yesterday. Like, this is what was working, this is what was going on. And so by, by using all those resources, we can confidently write a report about a river, whether we were on it today or haven't been on it for a week. Um, and, and that's something that's been critical to our success. And, pretty important to this overall model. So now that we've, you know, talked your ear off with our, our, you know, what we do and who Flycast is, we'll get into sort of how the, the sausage is made and, you know, the, the methods to the madness. But, you know, Travis mentioned it, we've got six key variables that go into the forecasting and the weekly reports. You've got river flow, air and water temperature, sky conditions, precipitation, barometric pressure and hatch activity. So one of the, the cooler things that we were able to do is we we're when we developed this methodology, we were able to back test our reports. Uh, Travis actually stumbled upon a really cool archive of reports over the last couple of years that we were able to test um, our own reports on. So we wrote I don't know, what was it, 20, 20 or so reports uh, just in our kitchen one day based on, you know, the flow, the air temperature and, and all these various variables and then went back and checked it and almost 95% of those uh, reports that we had written blind were, were accurate. So it was at that point that we really knew uh, we had something. So at, at this point, you know, we'll, we'll get into each of these variables and, and how that impacts trout behavior, where, whether it's where they're holding, how they're feeding uh, and whatnot. But we'll, we'll start with flows and go from there. Yeah, awesome. So uh, flows is probably one of those things that we're most familiar with as anglers. It's 
um, readily available on the internet. It's on every fly shop web, you know, website. And so we're, we're pretty familiar with it, but really we look at it for two key things. One is holding position and two is trout feeding. So from a holding position standpoint, when we have high flows, we know that trout are going to push into soft water towards banks behind structure, um, really because they're looking to one, conserve energy. Um, and they do that by getting out of that fast current. And then two, with high flows, there's a lot of debris in the water. And so they're protecting themselves from that. So like in spring runoff, you're just picking apart those banks. Um, and that's because that's where it's a safe and comfortable spot for those trout to hold. Conversely, when the flows are low, we know clarity is high, flows are low, obviously. And so trout are vulnerable to aerial prey um, as well as anglers. And so they will really seek out those deep sections, pronounced sections of the river, such as pools and runs, and hold deep for that protection. Um, not as much spread out because of that vulnerability. Now, when flows are stable at a, at, a, at a healthy level, trout are then really able to move about the water depending on the current temperature, hatch activity, and what might be going on. Now, from a feeding standpoint, going back to high flows, um, we have high water, which dislodges big bugs from the bottom of the river, stoneflies, caddis, worms. Um, and so trout are one, looking for those bigger meals or capitalizing on those bigger meals. But two, there's so much debris and so many bugs flowing at them that sometimes takes a little extra work to get their attention. So having a big bug, a flashy bug like a rainbow warrior is really ideal. Um, low flows, high water clarity. Uh, low flows are generally associated with winter. So we have smaller bugs in the winter, small midge, small imitative betas patterns. Um, they're keying on those, those really small patterns and not as, I guess, attracted to uh, the big flashy items in the water. And then when flows are normal, they, they, can, they can adjust to the, the habitat around them. Whatever is hatching at that moment, um, they're keying in on. You can get away with big bugs, flashy bugs. It's, it's really the, obviously the ideal time to be out fishing. All right. Um, we got a question or somebody in there? I think it's just background noise. Okay. Um, so now looking at air and water temperature. Again, this is probably another very big variable that we all look at for various reasons. But um, what we can determine based off of air and water temperature is really where the trout are going to be holding at that given depth, time or day. So in the summer, the past few months, you know, Colorado experiences pretty hot, hot weather. And even the mountain streams will creep up into the 90s, 95 range. And so what happens when the water temperature rises, the oxygen in the water decreases. And because trout need oxygen like humans, they will move into the more oxygenated water, which is um, like riffles, transition areas, fast runs, pockets, really that, that irritated water is where all the oxygen is. And so if we're coming out on a morning you know, we know that trout are probably going to be in a little bit of the slower water as, as temperatures are rising. But as the temperatures peak, they're going to be moving in that fast water. And that's when picking apart those ripples and pockets is a lot of fun in the summer. Now, obviously, we know times where water temperatures can rise above unsafe levels, which is 67 degrees. Um, at that point, you know, trout will really retreat back deep into the pools and almost go into conservation mode similar to winter. You know, they're not concerned about feeding, they're just concerned about survival. And so looking at those things, we're able to figure out where trout are during the summer months. Now the fall, that's what we're in right now. And as Coloradans, we know that Colorado likes to throw us curveballs and 40 degree, 50 degree temperature swings in a single day are not uncommon. So for example, you know, if you're looking at um, Friday or Saturday on this screen, we see that it's going to be, you know, 31 degrees in the morning. The morning temperatures are a big indicator for us, particularly of, in the sense of when we want to hit the water. If we have sub-freezing temperatures in the morning, that water is cooled off. Trout are going to are be are going to be lethargic and they're going to take a little bit more time to wake up. Same with same with the bugs. And so in the morning, we're focusing on that soft water, slack water, banks, tailouts, um, places where trout don't have to work very hard to consume food. 
as the temperature rises, they will do more some of the, the summer um, moves where they'll slide into slow riffles, runs, and things like that to where they can take advantage of the food as well as, um, you know, receive a little bit more of that oxygen. So there's a little bit more maneuverability in the fall. And as far as the, the winter is concerned, you know, I think we touched on it earlier, but we're fortunate enough to be able to fish year round. You know, at this point, you're, you're largely, you're largely down to just the tailwaters. These are places where water temperatures are, are fairly consistent. You know, you've got pretty consistent bug life. We'll get into some of that a little bit later, but you know, in the winter time, trout are largely in conservation mode. The amount of bugs flowing through the water and the size of those bugs is, is smaller and, and minimal. So at this point, they're, they're largely holding in the deeper, slower pools and runs so as to, to conserve energy and you know, barely coming out into some of the faster riffles to, to capitalize on food and, and keep going. But you know, it's a little bit trickier time of year. You have the the fact that you've got lower flows, which does help with sight fishing. So it, it, and on top of that, you know, you've got fewer variables at play that can swing the needle in terms of hatch activity and where trout might be holding. So it does eliminate some of the guesswork, but in general, trout can be a little bit more sluggish and it makes things, you know, a little bit more difficult, albeit more predictable. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Moving on to sky conditions. Um, so really for our purposes, we look at three different sky conditions. We have sunny, partly cloudy and overcast. You know, they say skiers love a bluebird day, anglers love an overcast day. An overcast day is the angler's bluebird day. And so um, based on those three different conditions, again, we're able to figure out what part of the river they're holding and what depth they're holding. Depth is an incredibly important part of the fishing process. Um, you could be fishing the right bug all day long, but if you're drifting it right over their head or drifting it below them, they're not gonna take. And so those factors are incredibly important for that, for that reason. Um, so when it's sunny, it's generally more technical just because trout are on a high alert, they're skittish. We have to keep our, our, um, our uh, shadows off the river. Um, and they're going to be holding deeper in those more pronounced areas. They're concerned about their safety from aerial predators and anglers, as I mentioned before. So they're going to be holding deep along shelves where they can retreat to the deep water. Or if it's in the summer, might be in those riffles where, you know, the surface is obstructed, so it's not as easy to see through. It's a lot easier to sight fish a trout that's holding in a still pool than in a riffle. When it's partly cloudy, again, it's kind of like a mixed bag, but trout will adjust their position as the sky, as the sky adjusts. And so, you know, mid column is, is really where trout are going to hang out. Um, outside of that, it, it'll really depend. If the sun comes out, they might drop a little bit lower, move towards some rocks. And then if the clouds move over the sun, they'll come a little bit closer and feed on those emerging patterns. Now overcast, those are the days we want. Those are the days we love. Um, trout really spread out. They can hold in those shallow tail outs along the banks feed on the surface, feed on emergers, hang on the bottom. Really, they have everything's available to them. And so on those days, we really talk about covering a lot of water, not spending all your time in that one pool, but, but covering everything and doing your best to observe. Um, so I'm going to let Taylor just run through a couple scenarios just, just so we can put into practice. And, and he's just really going to combine air and water temps with those sky conditions to see where those trout might be moving towards. Cool. So yeah, this is something we we normally do live and you know try to get a little bit more interaction, but understand that the uh, the circumstances have changed. But you know, first let's go with warm afternoon and sunny skies. So in in this case, you know, your Travis talked about you know the sun exposure and the fact that trout are going to be prioritizing their survival and their safety. So in this case, you know, you're going to want to fish the riffles or the transition areas or those deeper runs where they're not highly visible to aerial predators. So second, let's go with overcast and mild temps. You know, in this case, you know, we're looking at pretty much ideal situation, you know, cloud covers giving trout the sense of protection. They're able to move about the water. 
mild temps are signaling um, hatch activity. So at this point, you know, you're going to want to focus on either those pools and transition areas or the tailouts. So in a lot of cases, you know, trout will hold in a pocket where the water is slower, where they can conserve that energy and move out into one of the faster riffles where that bug life is actually coming down the water uh, to feed and then they'll sort of transition back. So third, let's go with partly cloudy and cold. So this, uh, this sort of comes back to the, the winter scenario that we, we talked about, or maybe like an early fall morning like today. The cloud cover or the partly cloud cover um, scenario definitely works in our favor as anglers. Trout are a little bit more ambitious in terms of their feeding. But on the cold side of things, you're, the water temperature is going to be cold and trout are going to be a little bit more sluggish in the sense that you know, they're prioritizing uh, conserving their energy as opposed to feeding. So at that point, you know, you're either looking for, you're either waiting for air temperatures to rise when they do uh, capitalize on some of the hatch activity, or you're just focusing on uh, getting your flies deep and those slower, deeper pools and runs. And I'll just say, if you guys have any questions, feel free to fire them on the uh, message board. I believe we should be able to see those. Um, we'll also have some time at the end to take care of those questions. All right. Well, so one of the last things that, um, one of the, well, I guess one of the more highly debated things that we, we look at is, is barometric pressure. And, you know, in simple terms, barometric pressure is the weight or the pressure that the Earth's surface uh, receives from the atmosphere. And so as humans, you know, we experience this phenomenon when we increase or decrease in elevation, whether you're driving up a, a mountain pass or you're uh, ascending or descending in an airplane when, you're, when your ears actually plug. And so I don't know how many of you guys have had this experience. I'm sure many or most of you had, but you'll be out on the water and you've had, you know, countless fish and you just really can't explain why, or maybe it's, it's uh, conditions are perfect um, aside from air pressure and, and you aren't catching anything. Barometric pressure is really one of those, those X factors that we um, do rely on pretty heavily. And while we don't consider ourselves meteorologists by any means, uh, based on you know previous observations and back testing, we found it to be fairly uh, effective in terms of predicting you know where trout are holding in the water and what type of bugs they're feeding on and you know to what extent they're they're feeding. And so within the the forecast and how we report on things, we look at three different measures. One, you've got the the high side scenario, and this one it can be a little bit hit or miss because it's often it it often coincides with sunny skies, but in general, you know, like our ears when we're climbing or descending in elevation, you know, trout are looking to neutralize their bladder. <clears throat> and so when there's high air pressure, you know, trout are experimenting with various depths in order to neutralize that, um, that pressure on their bladder. Travis talked a lot about survival. Trout in a sunny sky situation, which is often correlated with high air pressure, will prioritize survival first, and then they'll look at their comfort level. Beyond that, it's feeding. So in, in this situation, you're going to want to look at fishing small and flashier patterns. So in this scenario, you're not necessarily, trout necessarily aren't looking to feed heavily, but if you can get their attention with some tiny, small flashback um, something or other like a rainbow warrior, um, your odds are going to be better. And then the second category is the is the medium or ideal case in in our situation. The the as far as depth goes, trout are holding at various levels within the water. They're a little bit less selective, and at this point, they're they're basically like in their element and they're able to feed um, on you know what's actually flowing in the water. So at this point, you're going to want to go with the more imitative bugs, you know, in the, the midge or uh, betas variety, or depending on the, the time of year, whether it's a caddis or, or so on. And then finally, we have the, <clears throat> the low category. This is, this really comes back to that, that ear plugging example where, you know, when I am high in elevation, I have a lot of pressure on my body and my ears start to plug. And so in order to alleviate that, 
we want to reduce or decline in our elevation. And it's very much the same for trout. So in a, in a scenario where pressure is low, trout will hold in the deepest water columns. And you know, while they'll feed selectively, it's not quite as selectively as the high situation. They're prioritizing their comfort and then it's feeding. But if you've, if you've ever fished streamers, um, this is often a great uh, situation to do so because oftentimes we'll get low pressure storms that signal trout to feed before the storm comes. So in that case, you're going to want to go with sort of bigger, messier, imitative bugs like a like a Pat's rubber leg or a stonefly or even like a small bait fish for a streamer. Um, but as far as nymphs go on your trailer flies, you're going to want to keep them smaller and imitative as well. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, like a Pat's, Pat's rubber leg followed by a number like size 22, blood midge, zebra midge. You're really able to take care of both fronts. You, you can you can attract them with the hearty meal, but more often than not, you know, that small one is going to be a little bit more comfortable for them. All right, precipitation. In Colorado, we experience two types, well, a lot of types, but, uh, you know, snow and rain is really what we're working with. And so precipitation really affects several factors. One, holding position, two, hatch activity, and three, trout feeding. Um, from a holding position standpoint, precipitation, with that comes cloudy skies more often than not. And so with those cloudy skies, as we mentioned, trout spread out more, they're more willing to feed near the surface, um, and, and they're less selective in, in where they position themselves in the river. Um, from a hatch activity standpoint, precipitation increases humidity, and humidity helps encourage hatches. And so I don't know if you guys have ever been on the river, I'm sure you have, when you know, you're on the river and the storm's approaching and you get a heavy hatch. Humidity's increased. The storm hits in the rain, you know, you're really not going to have any bugs coming off. Um, that, that rain is not, does not help them hatch and, and get up and fly out of the water. Um, but immediately after that storm, there's high humidity in the air. There's usually a pretty prolific hatch after a summer rainstorm. And so if you're ever on the river and it starts to pour on you, sit it out in your car because as soon as it ends, you're in for some really good dry fly fishing. Um, now, in the winter, um, when it's snowing, same thing happens. There's still humidity, but you actually can experience some pretty great hatch activity. Actually, in this picture here, um, it was November, snowing all day long, and there were midges coming off like crazy. We probably caught 20 fish on the dry, and this is Bear Creek and Evergreen. Um, and so winter holds similar effects, but it does allow you the opportunity to fish dries during the actual storm. Um, and then the last thing, as Taylor kind of mentioned with the low pressure, um, as storms approach, it signals trout. And they're like, all right, I got to take advantage of some food. I got to stock up and wait out the storm because they don't know what it's going to bring. Um, it also pushes bait fish towards, towards the shallower water. And so this is a perfect time to slap some streamers on the bank, strip them erratically, because those more predatory browns and rainbows, they're looking for that hearty meal and they're willing to take advantage of a small bait fish because um, that bait fish is going to hold them over for a good amount of time until that storm passes. So streamers leading up to a storm are absolutely fantastic. And then same with dry flies, um, particularly in the summer, but also even in the winter. So at this point, you know, we've covered, you know, a lot of the, the various factors and fundamentals that go into our, our forecast, whether it's flow, weather, sky, barometric pressure, but you know, we haven't really talked a whole lot about the hatch. And you know, at the end of the day, it, it, uh, it really does come down to what bugs or what flies you're using to imitate the bugs that are actually in the water. Um, so if you think back to the summer situation you know, that we had just a few months ago at this point, you know, you've got a wide variety of bugs. You've got everything from midges to BWOs, drakes, caddis, uh, you know, terrestrials and so on. But, you know, as we moved in to fall, you know, some of these hatches really started to, to die off. And that comes down to the water temperature as well as the, the ambient temperature. And I think terrestrials are, are one of my favorite examples for whatever reason, I guess they're just really fun to fish, but, um, you know, 
early fall, late summer, terrestrials or hopper droppers are an uh, incredibly effective way to fish. But after we get that first freeze overnight where air temperatures drop below 32 degrees, those bugs are no longer present on the water. And so at that point, you've really had this dynamic shift of you know, this prolific variety of bugs on the water to this dwindling uh, number of bugs moving forward. And, you know, while you'll get some caddis, you know, moving into October, you know, beyond that, you know, it's uh, beyond that as you move into the winter, it's it's largely those uh, betis and, and midge, predominantly midges, uh, throughout the majority of the winter. And uh, one of our buddies, he uh, loves to give us a hard time and says, you know, I'll I'll catch a trout on a hopper any time of the year, which obviously is true. Like anybody can do that. It's it's a great attractor pattern and you can easily get a trout to, or I shouldn't say easily, you can get a trout to turn its head up at a big meal like that. But by and large though, if you can identify the hatch, whether it's through kicking up some rocks, turning over a rock, figuring out what's actually in the water, and then translating that to what you have in your box, your odds are going to be dramatically better. And so that's that's one of the last things that you know really ties everything together and um, brings uh, brings it you know full circle. So, yeah, yeah one couple of things I'd add on to that is um, you know understanding the spawning schedules. Right now it's fall; it's the brown trout spawn in the spring. It's the rainbow. So while these aren't flies or bugs, you know egg patterns are incredibly effective as well as you know San Juan worms and red nymphs. I, I don't know if I can tell you why, but Red copper johns, red zebra midges, that, that red just really gets the trout's attention, particularly during the spawning months. Um, so those are things to consider as well. And streamers, highly effective during the spawning periods because they are aggressive, they're territorial. Obviously you're not targeting trout while they're on reds, but in general during this time of year, they are, are territorial and willing to chase some meat. Um, the other thing to consider is where you're fishing. You know, we have some tailwaters, tailwaters, usually receive scuds out of the dam from the reservoir. Scuds are fantastic, particularly, you know, I think about the South Platte, when flows jump, we know scud bite's gonna be on. And then you have a couple other rivers like um, the Frying Pan and the Blue that receive mysis shrimp um, and the Taylor. And same thing when the flows bump up, those mysis shrimp are uh, the best meal for those trout. And so uh, those are other things to keep in mind as well when, when selecting the, the patterns you go with on, on, your, on your rig. All right, we, uh, we ran through that relatively quickly. Um, so we wanna take a break. We just talked at you guys for a good 30, 40 minutes. Um, and open it up, whether it's via chat or however you guys want to do it on the on the mic, but feel free to shoot any questions you have our way. If you haven't already, check us out at, at flycastusa.com. You can email us night or day. We'll we take all sorts of requests, whether it's like, hey, where should I fish this weekend? Or, you know, do you know anybody in the area kind of thing? So our our lines are always open. So we encourage you to reach out if if you ever need anything. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to jump in with a couple questions here. Thanks guys. Great presentation. Um, yeah. I guess my first one is what are plans to grow the waters that you cover? Do you have plans in the near future kind of, um, I don't know, directions you want to grow if you're going to stay regional, try to be outside of Colorado, you know, anything along those lines? Yeah. Um, we absolutely have plans to expand, you know, Colorado was really our test. We started with a few confidence rivers and we've slowly expanded funny enough. You know, I think most of you guys are up in Fort Collins. We have plans, it's really poor timing, but we have plans to release a report on the Pooter starting Monday, okay. as well as the Roaring Fork. So every, every few months we try to add a few, um, but ultimately our goal is to cover all the major waterways in Colorado and then expand into Wyoming, Utah, Montana, et cetera. Um, this is something that, you know, it's a method that can be scaled. And so that's, that's really what we're hoping to do. Yeah, very cool. Um, and you may or may not want to answer this one, but I'm going to ask it. You guys said you're trying to make this more than the side hustle and I'm poking around in your site and it looks like everything's free. So I'm just curious, <laughs> what's the, what's the path to monetization there? Yeah. So, 
you know, the first couple of years have really just been a, a proof of concept. And I think we've done a really good job at building a following and, you know, proving the, you know, the, the need for this, this, uh, this resource. And so at this point, you know, we're, we're working on, you know, pulling our community together as well as, you know, coupling that with the information. We, we really like the fact that the reports and the information are free. We think everybody deserves that information and we don't expect that to change, but we do work pretty closely with a number of different fly shops uh, on a number of affiliate deals. And, you know, we've got a number of different projects here out in the works um, in terms of uh, similar collective uh, affiliate deals, but we've also got uh, an app that's sort of secondary to the reports, but um, more, or I should say, complementary to the reports that would actually be a paid service. But, but yeah. Got it. Well, thanks for satiating my curiosity there. Yeah. Um, sure. Note to everybody else, you can unmute yourself. So if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute and ask away. Yeah, this is Mickey. I have a, a question. I put it in the chat room, but um, we heard uh, this or last Saturday that fishing licenses sales are up by about 30% this year. And I was wondering, uh, and I also belong to a Facebook group called Colorado Fly Fishing, I think. Do you account for crowds at all? You talk a lot about deckers, you know, these heavily pressured waters. Does that impact the uh, fish pattern, you know, the patterns we're using or anything like that? Um, just yeah. wondering if you're going to account for that in the future. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny you bring it up. Taylor and I actually started talking about that when COVID hit because like, you know, the, the fishing license data showing fly fishing and fishing in general spiked. And actually our, our website traffic has never been higher. There's more people on the river. Um, and so through like our Google analytics and stuff, we're actually able to see those trends already. You know, I keep talking about Deckers. Deckers is, you know, the most visited page on our website by two to three times the second. Um, and so we, we do have visibility in that. We eventually would like to be able to broadcast that or forecast that pressure for people. Um, but from a productivity standpoint, it, it absolutely has an impact. You know, Deckers was pretty tough this spring and summer because there were more people on that river than I'd ever seen. And I'm sure you guys experienced that on the pooter and whatnot. Um, but yeah, trout become selective. And, and when that happens, we usually tend to go small and go simple. Um, you know, simple thread midges, simple betas, neutral cover colors. What were we going to say? Two midges. Yeah, favorite. yeah, double midge patterns. Um, if they're not liking what you're throwing, go simple because they've seen a million rainbow warriors. They've seen a million juju betas and whatnot. So small and simple and then downsizing your tippet while it's stressful when you're fighting a fish. It, it's better to hook into a few than, than to not, not get any with a, a larger tippet size. I will say though, while we don't quantitatively apply that to our forecast, there is certainly a qualitative aspect to it within the weekly reports or the daily forecast, we will say like, it's a weekend, like it's Deckers, it's going to be crowded. So do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So um, nothing super qualitative or quantitative at the moment, but we do we do call it out, especially in places like the Dreamstream or the deck or Deckers or even the, the blue uh, in Silverthorne. Yeah. The Dream actually talks about it right now, Kokanee spawn and the Lake Run brown trout have everybody flock into the Dreamstream. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something to consider, especially if you want solitude, which isn't very easy to find anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> and then the follow-up to that is, as you develop the technology, will you, you, you talk about the Poudre River. I know you have a flycast report for the Big Thompson. Um, you know, those are long rivers. Will you be dividing it up into reaches eventually or? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think the best example of our current reporting would be the Colorado River. Um, right now we break it up into the upper and middle, which the upper being that partial uh, windy gap area, the middle being pump house, you know, Kremlin to, you know, uh, Dotsero or whatever, 
We've also got the Arkansas, the Upper Arc, and Buena Vista and Salida, and then as well as the, the Pueblo Tailwater. But yeah, you're right. It's really important to, to break it up, whether it's you know at the, the bottom of a canyon within the Poudre or if it's all the way up, um, further up. So yes, the, the short answer is we do intend to be specific about what section we're reporting on and you know expand from there. Yeah, we generally start with the most heavily fished first, you know, like the Big Thompson, for example, below Lake Estes is what we do. Um, I, I'm sure a ton of people go into the park, but that access right off the road just brings a lot more anglers. So we just want to catch as many anglers as possible up front and then start adding them on as we go. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are on the Big Thompson right now, every pull off has, at least before they close 34. Yeah. Every pull-off had multiple cars on a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah, we, we saw that as well in Clear Creek. And I saw a question come in asking where we're located. Um, we're, we, we're out of Denver. I, I live in Denver. Taylor just relocated to Golden. Um, so we're very much that Denver metro um, region. Um, and so, yeah, Clear Creek, we'd get out, sneak out on Tuesday after work. And that used to be an easy time to go. But between these, you know, working from home times, every pull out. And so you got to get creative, which is good because it actually makes you a better angler because you don't get to fish that honey hole or that prime run. You have to work with that less desirable water. And oftentimes that's the, that's the place you find some of the best fish because they're, you know, not suspecting you and they're, they're generally less selective. We did, funny enough, yeah, Taylor and I actually spent four years in Fort Collins. We both are CSU grads, so the Pooter is near and dear and um, love that region up there. Yeah. What about targeting different species of fish? What differences do you make there? You know, to be honest, we're pretty big trout bums. <laughs> um, so right now we've been pretty focused on cold water species and trout. Um, we haven't really discussed getting into to much more than that. You know, we're, we're, we do dabble in high alpine lakes, but um, to be honest, this last summer, we did the mile high 25 competition from anglers all. And it was really our first time targeting warm water species. Like we hit city park. Um, that might be something that develops in the coming years, but for right now, I think we're pretty focused on, on the trout and, and, and river. But as far as like, we don't necessarily call it out uh, within our reports, but we certainly could, like whether it's whitefish or suckerfish, like, yeah. you know, you're going to want to target the, the trenches, you're going to get your, your flies as deep as possible and, and just drag them across the water, that, that kind of thing. That's certainly something we could incorporate um, if that's, if that's uh, something that people are interested yeah. in, for sure. I, I would say in general, these conditions, I think are relatively transferable to most trout species. You know, they all, they have that air bladder. Um, they're sensitive to the changing conditions and whatnot. And so I'd, I'd say for the most part, it, it can probably be, probably be applied, but there's some nuances in there that we definitely need to explore and get more familiar with. Are you guys going to stay away from the musky forecasting then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. That's uh Chuck a streamer and pray, I think, is, is the forecast there. Uh, this is Art Campfield. I have a question <laughs> related to Mickey's question about pressure. Um, one of the things in animal feeding behavior is something that's novel that they haven't seen before. So how do you account for that in your prediction? I have a lot of experience of showing fish something they haven't seen that's not in the fishing reports and that's novel. It's something new and for a while it seems to work. Particularly, I fish on the small streams in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so how do you account for that? The fact that they've seen 10 or 20 or 30 uh, rainbow warriors and now comes something that isn't in your report. Yeah, so that's, I, I'm really glad you brought that up. And that, that brings me to my favorite example <clears throat> uh, the Blue River below the, the Dillon Reservoir, just in, in the town of Silverthorne, is a perfect example of that. Those trout see hundreds, if not more, myers, mice, and shrimp every day. Um, we do a winter fly fishing clinic there at least twice a year for the last couple of years. And uh, one of our buddies uh, at Colorado Trout Hunters, he brings his own 
like non-commercial pattern of a mycie shrimp. So it's something like you said that these Ooh, trout and, 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 and it is incredibly the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the other side of the, the equation, um, Travis mentioned, keep it simple. Um, you mentioned rainbow warriors, that's not necessarily simple, but um, if you think back to a tube midge or a thread midge, I don't even like, I don't even know if you can buy a thread midge, but I think you can, you probably don't want to. Yeah, it's so like, easy to you tie. It's just, a, it's just a, a hook and some thread. Like it's something that they don't necessarily see all the time, but it's simple or just a tube midge, something super simple that people aren't necessarily thinking to, to fish. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And I, I think that's a really key factor to, to account for. And it's certainly something we, we do consider uh, on these highly pressured tailwaters, especially. Yeah. I'll, I'll follow on to that question. How much do you think um, size matters? Like I've had some luck and cheesemen in places like that just throwing some ridiculously big stuff at times when they're only supposed to be eating small. You guys find that too? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes that's the variation that we were talking about in the last time. If they're seeing nothing but size 22 RS2s, throw them something meaty, might get their attention. We would argue that it probably largely plays into uh, barometric pressure. I think that's a pretty interesting variable there. For example, I was out on uh, Pueblo tailwater with a, a good guide buddy of mine, and we, we were really struggling to catch fish all day. I recognized that the pressure was high, and I started, even though flows were low, I started throwing rainbow warriors and red copper johns, and I started bagging fish. And so I think there's those small nuances that barometric pressure offers that, that could explain that. And then again, you know, I, I think it just goes back. Sometimes it's not, there's not an answer for everything, but if that trout see nothing but small stuff and they see a big meal come, they realize, hey, I can eat this one thing and chill for a couple hours, or I can keep eating mysis every, or midge every two seconds. They might take advantage of that. But, you know, um, I think we've all hit that point fishing where nothing is working so you break out the mop fly you break out the stone fly even though it's the dead of winter and it, it, it works and so those are kind of those slump buster patterns so um big or flashy are, are really good ones to go with when just nothing seems to be working any other questions from you guys these have all been awesome it's almost more fun just to talk about it than just to, <laughs> to preach it at you guys through a presentation. All right. Well, I, I have a question about winter. Okay, so you mentioned several factors. So um, what, would, what would be kind of the order of priority if you were gonna pick a day and I read your forecast and the weather, I had some idea of the pressure I had an idea of early morning temperatures, but another day I had another set of situations. How would you decide when I should uh, hike down to the river and be cold, but have fun? Hmm. Uh, honestly, I'd prioritize air temperature, to be honest. Um, if it's freezing cold, you know, that's whether it's a tailwater or not, it's going to translate to some extent to the to the water temperature. but. You know, in Colorado, it's not uncommon to have an afternoon of 50 degrees in the winter. So prioritize air temperature and then how that relates to your timing. So in general, in the winter, unless you're trying to get your favorite spot on the dream stream or 11 mile, you know, you're not out there right away. You're letting the water warm up. You're letting air temperatures rise. Hatch activity start to, to pick up. And then from there, um, you're actually fishing. But but yeah, ideally you're looking for a mild temperature day with, with a little bit of cloud cover. And yeah, in the winter, I'd say, we always talk about the 10 to three window. Fish the warmest hours of the day. It's nicer for you. Trout are actually awake. Nothing's worse than, we've done it plenty of times. We were in uh, the canyon below Green Mountain Reservoir last January and we got there at 8 a.m. and we froze our butts off all day. Didn't catch anything. But damn it, we were the only ones in the river. So, um, you know, it depends on what you what you want. Um, I will just say that the second thing that I would look at, you know, maybe not so much winter, it's very much temp, but really a big factor for me is I look at that pressure um, more so than anything else. Because I, I really do believe that that 
can change things. Like I've just been on the river too many times when it's overcast and mild and I don't see a trout and they don't respond to anything. <laughs> and so to me, it's really that pressure that can play a huge role. So temperature and pressure is really what I'd look at this winter. Set your alarm clocks back. It's kind of nice to not leave, leave your house at 5 a.m. I, I wonder about the 10 to three that you read about. Since here often our peak temperature, you know, is in, in, in not in the dead of winter, but it's through four o'clock in the afternoon. So is 10, I find 10 is still too cold. Sometimes we're talking about, you know, one to three or until it gets so cold, you can't take it anymore. Yeah. And you know, you're probably right. I think you probably caught me there. I, I'm in my, my fall mindset. And so I just wrote reports today <laughs> and I was talking about 10 to three. So that's probably more of a fall gauge in the winter. You're absolutely right. Noon one is really when it probably picks up. So, yeah. And sadly, you know, you do have that element of other people on the river. So to give yourself a chance to be there, um, you know, we, we side on the earlier side. You also, you know, I also just really like to fish whether I'm catching fish or not. And so I, I'll get out a little earlier, whether it's going to be productive or not, just to, just to make sure I got my time spent on the water. But yeah, you definitely want to fish the, the peak heat hours uh, in the winter specifically. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I just really want to say thank you so much for presenting to us tonight. Tons of great info and um, look forward to seeing those pooter casts starting on Monday. Yeah, sounds great. Unfortunately, they won't be too useful at the moment with the forest, you know, the national forest closures, but they'll be there. And as Taylor mentioned, shoot us an email anytime. Um, even if it's a river we don't cover, we'll help you out. And we're, we're really just willing to talk anything about fishing. So yeah, thank you, Colin. Thank you guys as well for hanging out with us tonight and letting us geek out on conditions. Oh, uh, looks like there's one last question in the chat if we got a quick second for it. Uh, Terry asked, do you carry a barometer in your car? And how does high altitude affect the pressure? So we don't carry a barometer in our car. Um, we usually just check that morning before we head out. Um, wouldn't be a terrible thing to have, but I, I would say it's probably pretty consistent if you check that morning. And then higher altitude, you know, I, I don't know that we have any information on that. Not really experienced a difference. So um, if we do find out, I'm sure it does. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, as far as I guess my head was going towards like Alpine lakes and like 10,000 plus sure. feet, but yeah, um, I can't necessarily speak to that side of things, but yeah, yeah, it is certainly something we keep a close eye on with our phones, but I, I think that's a really good idea is to actually bring a barometer with us, you yeah. know, see it change throughout the day. Well, thanks so much again, guys. We really appreciate it. Um, to everyone on the call, I just want to remind you that next month is the business meeting. So we're going to be having the elections for uh, chapter officers. So be sure to be there for that and uh, be sure to check out the flycast. I hope everybody has a great rest of their week and good luck on the water. Thank Thanks, you guys. all. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Have a great night.